Greetings, I'm Kathy Green with Christian News and Interviews. Today is July the 25th, and if Emmett Till were alive, this would be his 80th birthday. He would be 80 years old today. And you know, the story of Emmett Till is sad enough, but the knowledge that he died over a lie, that makes it so much, so much sadder and almost unbearable to think about. My father is from Alabama and my mother is from West Virginia. I grew up in Baltimore. And so growing up, one of the fun things that we did in the summer, um, we would either go to Alabama to spend time with my father's family. Like it was, it was called going down to the country because all my relatives owned land and we could run around on the land and play and just have a great time. We would chase the pigs and, and we would get in trouble for chasing the pigs, but um, we would chase the pigs. We would, uh, it, it was, the, it was a far, it was farmland and it was owned by my family in Alabama. And we just had the time of our lives in the country where we were safe Everybody was related to everybody, and it was our own land, so we were we didn't have to worry about anybody driving up on our land and just fun memories, fun times, meeting my cousins and spending time with my aunt, my aunts and my uncles and oh just that's a huge part of the black community. Those of us who live on the Mason Dixon line or up north, we would go down south to the country to spend time with our relatives. And then my mom is from West Virginia, so the same thing. We would spend some, some of our summers or part of our summer in West Virginia, uh, watching my grandmother kill the chickens and chase the chickens around and just beautiful memories. And so when I hear that Emmett Till was from Chicago and that he was sent down south to the country uh, to spend time in Mississippi, I totally get it. I get it. Because those of us who live, you know, north of the Mason-Dixon line, we, we, we get it. it. It was just such a fun time. And so I can imagine that Emmett Till uh, looked forward to going down south to the country to be with his country cousins and to tease them about their southern accents and things like that. And to think that he walked to a store, an innocent child of 14 who had a reputation for being a jokester, someone who liked to laugh and how someone who enjoyed making other people laugh, to go down to the country to spend time with his family, to go to a store, to walk in, and to find himself lied on by a woman who was so mentally disturbed that she couldn't keep a husband. She went through about four husbands during the course of her life. And to have her look at this 14 year old child and tell such a dirty lie on him, um, it's just unbelievable. And how she continues to live with herself after lying on him like that for no reason. I don't know how she continues to live with herself, but she's in hiding. And um, at least she has her life. But how that woman has been able to sleep at night knowing what she did to that little boy, I will never comprehend as long as I live. But just to read a little bit about um, her lie that, that caused this young man to lose his life. Listen to this. For six decades, she's been a silent woman linked to one of the most notorious crimes in the nation's history, the lynching of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old black boy, keeping her thoughts and memories to herself as millions of strangers idolized or vilified her. But all these years later, a historian uh, says that the woman has broken her silence. And this article is a few years old, okay? And acknowledged that most, the most incendiary parts of the story she and others told about Emmett claims that seem tame today, but were more than enough to get a black person killed in Jim Crow era Mississippi were false. 
The woman, Carolyn Bryant Donham, spoke to Timothy B. Tyson, a Duke University professor, possibly the only interview she's given to a historian or journalist since shortly after the episode, who's written a book, The Blood of Emmett Till, to be published next week. In it, she, he wrote that she said of her long ago allegations that Emmett grabbed her and was menacing and sexually crude towards her. Quote, unquote, that part is not true. The revelations were first reported on Friday by Vanity Fair. As a matter of narrow justice, it makes little difference, true or not, her claims did not justify any serious penalty, much less death. The two white men who were accused of murdering Emmett Till in 1955 and later admitted to it in Look Magazine interview were acquitted that year by an all-white, all-male jury and so could not be retried. Hmm. I could go on and on reading about this article. But what I'm going to do instead, because I know you can read. I'm going to, the article is titled, Woman Linked to 1955 Emmett Till Murder Tells the Story and Her Claims Were False. And it's a New York Times article. I'm going to post it below. But I will just end by saying this. Um, his mother suffered. His family suffered. Those of us who have a conscience, every time we think about it, it just pains us to think how he was tormented and tortured for nothing. A jokester. A happy little boy. It's heartbreaking. And so today would have been his 80th birthday. And I just say, you know, a lie can cause so much damage. And I'll just leave you with this. Be very cautious of your words. Be very cautious what you say about people. No hyperbole, be honest. Because this is such an example of what a lie can do. Blessings.